My name is Abigail Sirivag. I am a member of the Education Committee. Um, we are excited to feature this networking opportunity this morning with the Missouri Gateway Chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, today we have some members and some non-members of the chapter, so thanks for joining us. And our chapter, like many nonprofits throughout the country, uh, rely on funding, and the biggest source is through our membership. So if you aren't already a member, we'd love to have you consider joining us. Um, we do have a couple of announcements to share really quick. Our fall member social is coming up next month on October 11th, uh, so we'd love to see you there. Also, we are currently accepting proposals for the 2023 education calendar. Um, so we want you to show us your green building solutions this year. Uh, we use proposals to help plan our evening programs as well as these coffee breaks throughout the year. And Freddie will drink, uh, drop the link in the chat with more information about the call for proposals. Mm -hmm. And the goal for our coffee break this morning is to provide an opportunity for our community to engage in conversational hot topics over a cup of coffee um, in our 30 short minute break. And our theme for today's conversation is ESG, Environment, Social and Governments. And to speak on this topic and to lead our discussion is Chris, Chris Lofman. Um, a senior energy and sustainability professional. And Chris is an accomplished subject matter expert in sustainable real estate operations with over 20 years of experience in real estate operations uh, with the past 10 years focused on sustainability, energy efficiency, water conservation, and waste management in commercial office and multifamily residential real estate. He's also a LEED AP o &M certified professional um, and has proven success in developing ESG strategies built on data analysis, transparency, and reporting. He's worked with clients among <clears throat> multiple real estate vehicles to help develop what ESG programs should focus on, benchmarking energy, water waste, and greenhouse gas emissions, um, to identify opportunities to reduce their impact. And Chris also provides measurement and verification with um, ongoing surveillance of performance once projects are executed. In addition, he authors a weekly ESG blog called 39. So with that, Chris, thanks for joining us and I'll pass it over to you. Cool. Thank you. Let me just share a screen real quickly here. That work all right? All right, um, so good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Lofman. Um, I've been associated with the chapter, I'm trying to think about this the other day, I think we're going back to like 2010, probably something like that. Um, I might be missing a year or two there, but but over the last five years or so, really my my focus has shifted from the St. Louis area really onto more of a national role. I work for a company called Graystar, and Graystar is actually the world's largest manager and and, and a very large owner of multifamily housing, and we also have uh, logistics properties as well as uh, life science properties. Uh, and we're a global company. Um, in the US, we have roughly 2,700 communities and almost a million people live in our, our properties across the country. So it's quite a footprint. Um, and there I work as the Senior Director of Energy and Sustainability. And, and really what that means is I work with utility consumption um, and the impact of that consumption. So when I talk about sustainability and ESG, just from a, a point of reference, I'm really often referring to the E in ESG, which is environment. And I bring that up because I think one of the issues that we've had in our industry is we keep changing the words that we use to talk about what it is that we're doing and it confuses people. I mean, when I started in this, we were talking about just efficiency or conservation and then Lead became a thing, and and uh, and and for quite a while, actually, people thought lead was everything that was to do with sustainability. And lead's great; it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not everything, but for a while, people thought it was. And then we started using the word green. Um, and then we learned what the word greenwashing meant, so we stopped using that word so much. Um, and then we started using the word sustainability for a while, which might be my favorite term, just because it's really focused on a long-term view. Uh, when I think about business sustainability, it literally means staying in business forever. Uh, but once again, we shifted and changed, and now we're using this word ESG uh, 
probably because it's a more inclusive term that includes more than just the environmental piece, right? Uh, the E stands for environmental, which is energy, water, waste, pollution, greenhouse gas emissions. The S though is the social piece. That's like the employees and the residents, in, in my case, our tenants, uh, working conditions. This is where DEI uh, comes into play, health and safety, really the people component, which is super important. Um, and then governance, the G, Sometimes people think that should actually come first because these are the rules, the policies, the procedures that really make everything else happen. But this is also where risk is um, and, and the opportunities that risk might provide. Um, and, and I bring that up because um, not only is it an acronym and we use way too many acronyms just to further confuse people about what we do, um, but I, I would kind of challenge everyone on the call um, to start thinking about ESG or sustainability from a risk lens. So it, I think in the past, we really thought about um, sustainability or ESG as, as cost reduction. And it is cost reduction, right? Um, but it's more complex than that. And risk really brings into account all the other capital that's involved or, or that could be associated with risk. And, and with that, it's hard to really even turn on the news anymore without seeing some story about you know ESG finance or this fund or or um, or you know the the amount I think it's forty trillion something like that yeah just the sheer volume of money that's now being invested into ESG focused investments and, and that's because we're measuring risk we're not just looking at financial returns but we're looking at non financial impacts as well. Um, so whether we like it or not, this has a lot to do with money. That also means while some may say that this topic has to do with politics, quite honestly, it's kind of about the money. Um, and, and it's not really political, even though some may want to try to make it political to try to make it divisive or, or what have you, there is just so much sheer money involved that I, I think the horse has left the barn. Um, so I, I, I don't think we're having that conversation as much as much, even though some may want to try to drag us there. Specifically within real estate, where USGBC concentrates you know, on the built environment and where we concentrate, when we think about real estate and we think about money, and, and the reason why I bring this all up is because real estate is seen as an inflation hedge. So even though we've seen kind of the, the downturn of the economy here over the last year, Investments continue. We're on track for over 234 billion in transactions in multifamily this year, compared to 231 billion last year. So we're still buying properties, and we have still substantial rent growth. We see record low vacancy rates, and that provides this like attractive supply demand imbalance that investors crave and want to put more money into it, which drives the importance of ESG. Now those investors want to make money, right? And the thing is, they want to reduce the risk associated with losing money, just like you would if you were making an investment as well. Part of that is transparency and understanding the, what risk that, that investment has. And, and from there, we start thinking about you know, things like climate disclosure, like what are the greenhouse gases that, may, uh, you know, or that are coming from the asset? Uh, what are the, uh, you know, is this in a flood zone? Is this in a, in a, uh, a forest area? And it's not just investors looking at it. The SEC is even looking at it um, for, to protect those investors, to, to make sure that we're disclosing things. In order to disclose things, we have to have data. And I know that was sort of a long segue to get to the point of data, but at the underpinning of almost every sustainability program or ESG program, is data. It's super important though, to understand that real estate itself is obviously complex. It has you know, multiple factors. There's not a single decision point. It's not something that we can make decisions intuitively. Um, I, I say that as an example, an example of something that we can do intuitively is, is when we cross the street, right? We don't need a spreadsheet to figure out if it's safe. We can walk up to the corner, we can look left, we can look right. We can take in visually what's the traffic, what's the weather, what are other pedestrians doing? We can make that decision just based on our gut feel, is it safe to move or not? 
with real estate because of the complexity of of just the assets themselves and the different uh, consequences of actions that we may take it's super important that we are using data and a process with that data so i just want to walk through real quick kind of the what i feel is some of the secret sauce that we use when we look at data in the process and, and that is first before we even start to pull the baseline data is asking the question why why are we doing this what is the issue we're trying to solve so many people want to run out and measure everything right away, which is super important to do. But before you measure, you need to understand why you're measuring. You also have to realize that, like I said earlier, the cause and effect connections of what it is you're trying to solve. Operational expense reduction may also be related and is related to carbon emissions reductions. And it could be related to asset value maximization. So there's multiple impacts that a single decision may have. So understand the context. Sometimes we call this the materiality, what's important. Um, once we know why we're doing it, that's when we start to go and pull the data. And data is messy, um, particularly depending on your, the type of real estate we're talking about, multifamily and, and triple net in particular are, are really challenged uh, because oftentimes we have sections of the building that we don't control the, the meter. And depending on the jurisdiction, we may or may not be able to get the data from those meters. Um, that also means that, that um, we, we have to, we may not have operational control of those areas. The thermostat may be controlled by a tenant and it makes it very challenging and sometimes even legally we can't control that area uh, to, to conserve. It's, it's really up to the tenant to conserve, which means we have to put an emphasis on engaging the tenant, educating them on why they want to reduce it, why it's in their best interest. Once we do know where that data is coming from, we want to do something called benchmarking. And I know we use this word a lot, but honestly, all benchmarking is doing is figuring out what is normal. How do we compare against normal? So we're looking at historical data, whether normalized, we're looking at you know other properties. We're, we're large enough that uh, we can look at our own portfolio to get a pretty good idea of, of uh, you know like buildings to compare against and pure buildings to compare against. But there are other uh, peer sets out there to compare energy star portfolio manager being one that you can use to compare your building and see how it's performing. But basically we're trying to figure out, you know, what is normal and how does my building, how do my buildings are building compare against normal? It's super important when you have 2,700 buildings is to know where to look because scale is real. Um, I mean, I could not get on an airplane and fly to every single building in probably five years, if I hit one a day, there's just, I just can't do it. So knowing where to look, where the biggest bang for the buck is super important. Not only is it important to know what buildings are not performing well, it's also important to know which buildings are performing well, because quite often there's best practices there that we can uncover and, and share with the portfolio. Sometimes low cost, no cost things can be gained from that. And from that, we can develop KPIs and figure out what it is that we want to identify what tangible, specific, and relevant measures can we measure um, in, in order to help us make decisions? As, as we continue down this process of what to do with the data, one thing I think that gets missed sometimes is making the data usable, make, visualizing that data. And, and by this, I, I think you've probably seen, uh, you know, dashboards and stuff that you literally need an engineering degree to read. If, if your decision maker needs an engineering degree to read your dashboard, your dashboard's too complex. You, you really need it to, to boil it down, use the KISS principle, keep it simple, and, and, and let it lead decision makers to be one step closer to actionable decisions that they can make from your data. So super important, particularly if you're sitting down with the CFO, to explain very simply in, in, in terms and terminology they understand, not all the acronyms that we like to throw out there. Here's why we wanna do this project. Here's why it makes sense. And, and, and here's the potential impact, which leads us to what type of impacts are we gonna make? Real estate is super, super local. We all know this on this call. We can literally have a building built by the same builder on the same street with the same design with two different performance profiles. Um, every building is unique. Um, so really going into each building and figuring out exactly what it is and by no, by benchmarking, we know which ones to hit first, 
we can do all the things that that really lead us to you know making the difference in the building be that fault analysis or solar or led lighting whatever it is and, and part of that too is doing the energy audit to understand what the opportunities are within those buildings once we've done the action once we've taken the action we need to prove the results we need to go back and measure what was the roi what was the payback um, this is your white paper quite honestly um, this is also your opportunity really to analyze reasons for failure or success and, and, and su suggest strategic improvements for the future and then we rinse and repeat this is a this is a learning loop this is our opportunity to figure out what was helpful what could be improved what was unnecessarily complex maybe we need to update templates or standards so this this is our opportunity before we do this all over again and when we think about this in a larger context of an esg program it even though we were just talking about this at a building level it's also what we do with an overall esg program we're looking at the company we're figuring out what's material to a company we're going to want to measure the baseline and figure out what is the current state where are we at and where, where is it that we're wanting to go what are those objectives and goals and from there what is the gap Here's, here's where we are, here's where we want to go. What is it that we need to do that's in between? From there, we can develop that strategic roadmap and what actions we want to take to get there, what those KPIs are. We report our progress, we rinse and repeat. So it's just a cycle. It's, it's really, it's actually not complicated. Um, that being said, um, I, I would just kind of throw it out to the audience. I mean, I know this was a ton of information in like a really compressed period of time, but that's the nature of, of coffee break, right? Is to try to get as much of that water cooler or that coffee uh, pot as you can before you have to go back to your desk. But but I would throw out to, the, to you guys, um, as, as you talk to your stakeholders and as you're really um, having conversations about projects and about uh, sustainability and, and maybe even about ESG, are you seeing a change in the language from just cost reduction projects to risk reduction projects? Or are you still seeing really the focus on efficiency? So I kind of, I'm going to pause, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop sharing and, and, uh, and, and let's talk about this. Or I'll talk to myself. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate your presentation. Um, I think this is a great topic. And so I was really excited to tune in for this coffee break. Um, one thing that I noticed in your initial process was the fact that getting the data comes before um, determining KPIs. And what I really appreciate about that is that sometimes I find people trying to set goals when they don't know what normal is. And so they don't know if the goals that they're setting are reasonable or achievable or in any way smart, uh, you know, with so the time bound and, and if that's realistic. And so I really appreciate that approach of just gather the data, set some general KPIs that we're going to start to track, and then from there decide what our goals should be. Um, so I, I just really appreciated that. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, uh, Annie. It's uh, how many times do you see these companies come out and say, we're going to reduce our footprint by 20%. Well, do, can you? Do you even know what your footprint is? How, how, I mean, so yeah, absolutely. It's super important to understand where you are before you promise to do something. It's, it's kind of like taking a road trip across the United States without setting where you're going to go. You just get on a road and drive. And, it, and that can be fun. Don't get me wrong. But I don't know that I want to do that with the company down the street. I might want to be a little more strategic about it. Chris, I'll chime in. First, uh, thank you for the presentation. You got me thinking over here. So before I spoke, I wanted to really think about what I said, but the answer is, it's because I haven't really talked at all about risk and you really got me thinking I should be um, to be really direct with my answer. But I'll also say, you know, my, I work for um, Azimuth Energy and we do commercial solar projects and 
also utility uh, projects. And, you know, that is a huge part of the businesses that what we're working with are focusing on. So, yeah, yeah it's a really, uh, I appreciate that uh, direction and thought. So thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Rebecca. It's, it's uh, think about what you do, right? You're, you're providing me uh, the capability to produce energy within my building at the rate that is set by the cost of the installation, basically. The, the, how much does it take to recover it? That removes the risk of gas prices going up and electrical grid prices going up. If I'm able yeah. to get it myself, and it's cleaner, um, you know, and, and I mean, by definition, fossil fuels are non-renewable sources. It doesn't matter how you feel about uh, renewable or fossil fuels or what have you. The bottom line is it, they, they will not last forever. By definition, they are not renewable. Therefore, the law of supply and demand says the less of them there is or the less demand for it there is, the more the cost is going to increase. So mm -hmm. as I think about, you know, places like California and New York that have done uh, actually laws that have said no more gas in new buildings, right? Yeah. I need to start thinking about what is the risk to my asset if there is a energy transition uh, and suddenly gas is five times the cost because people aren't using it anymore. California mm -hmm. is a big, big market. It's the eighth largest market in the, in the world. Um, when California says we're not buying natural gas anymore on the scale that they're saying it, that's going to impact other states, whether they like it or not, because it's a yeah. market driven economy. So mm -hmm. removing that risk of being reliant on another source and being able to produce it myself is a way to reduce risk. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. And you guys are easy. Give me some hard questions. Do I think the Cardinals are going to make the playoffs? Yes. When's Yachty going to hit 700? What's the date? When, when uh, Pujols? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I'm at Pujols. Oh, no, you're good. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not <laughs> betting on that one, though. I, I, think he, I think he hit like 705 is my guess. I oh, think you'll like, exceed it. Okay. What a story. What a, what a cool time to be from St. Louis. Yeah. Um, I guess in your experience, um, I well, so sorry, my, um, experience really isn't based in the resiliency conversation. It's really just based on how can we save energy and how can we save energy costs? And, um, but I'm getting more exposed to that. Uh, and so in your experience, I guess, like, what are some of the ways people have been focusing on resiliency? Because just in, um, like a discussion we've had here, we've touched on like a number of different versions of risk and how you want to address those risks. Um, you know, we talked about the, like you mentioned the increase in pricing, which I had never even considered that that would be a risk. Um, I usually think about it like from a physical security perspective of like, because we have a bunch of government projects and get National Guard projects, and they're more concerned with how do I react and what do I do when I lose water supply or I lose natural gas supply or the grid is down. Um, so I guess like, do you have kind of a, a categorized like way to approach having that conversation with a client? I mean, it's a great question. The, the resiliency is not just physical risk. Um, it, it, it is physical risk, like you outlined, right? I mean, is this a place where forest fires can hit? Is it a place where water is going to run out? Is it on the coast? Is, it, is my, is my uh, lobby going to be an indoor swimming pool in you know, 10 years? And investors want to know that. They want to know, what is the risk of me building a $150 million building Am I going to get my money out of it, right? Uh, but there's also market risk, right? That's the, the cost going up. Um, there's also risks that are associated with, with uh, from a market perspective that have more to do with geography. Even though you may have mitigated the risks at your individual buildings, if no one can get to your building, then your building may still be at risk. 
So you have to think about physical location. You have to think about proximity. Um, you have to think about ongoing operations. If, if I'm not having to move my residents out and pay for hotel rooms for them because they can no longer stay on my property, then I'm not making money off of the rent any longer, right? So I, I have to think about why am I buying the property? I'm buying it typically as a source of income, as, a, as something to make money off of. And then I'm trying to think about, okay, what is it that I need to do to keep that money coming in? There's also things like social risks, right? I mean, things can impact um, regulatory risks, laws change. So honestly, the, the, the resiliency conversation is a very large conversation that really encompasses a lot other than just am I in a flood zone or not you know but you're exactly right it, it's a it's a big deep conversation I, I I could probably take a couple hours to talk through the processes that you can do I can tell you this if you're looking at a, a, a great conversation on resiliency talk to your insurance folks that's what they've been doing for a hundred years what do you think an actuary is? I mean, they're looking at what is the likelihood that you're going to run into a car? Well, if you've been driving without a wreck for 20 years and you never look when you make right turns, eventually you're going to hit something. So therefore, they're going to raise your rates over time. Why? Because your risk has gone up. They're looking at the same thing with property as well. And, and we're seeing this right now. Actually, uh, uh, FM Global just is now tying climate risk to rates. Um, so the insurance industry has a lot of tools, and that's why I mentioned them. They have a lot of tools that are free that you can use to help assess risk. Um, FM Global in particular has always sort of been a trendsetter on like best practices and making you do things that you wouldn't have to do with a lot of other carriers. So that's, I don't work for FM Global, but they, they, they are pretty good at like asking you to do things that others don't ask. So that's a good one to just look at and see what are they doing. Uh, but I really think a lot of the resiliency conversation will come from the insurance industry because they're not yes. in business to lose money. Oh, God, sorry. No, you're good. Attention. I was just going to add something interesting that came up in one of my conversations with a prospective customer who was considering doing solar. And I'll say um, it was a building owner and they had commercial tenants that are huge, big, big companies. And they said, you know, we would consider installing solar to stay relevant and keep these tenants renting from us for a long time because they've got huge ESG goals. Exactly. So it's yeah. kind of the same thing. It's a risk. If they don't, they might lose these incredible tenants in a risky market. Right. And even on an individual basis, like in my world, in the world of multifamily property, um, you know, individuals are looking at that too. Like, right? I would guarantee there's probably a larger percentage in the USGBC community that care about their footprint than just in society in general. But 30% of my tenants care what their impact is, right? Mm -hmm. Across out of that million, that's 300,000 people that actually care. The other piece of it too, that people don't think about and that we're really trying to figure out how to grapple with is like EVs, electric vehicles. If I don't have EV charging on site at my apartment, I certainly am not an option for you whenever you're looking for a place to live. Um, yeah. There's actually a study in uh, LA and Seattle that says if you don't have uh, EV charging on site, you're no longer a class A property. Um, you know, people think about cars and car charging like they think about their cell phone. They, they want to plug it in at night. They want to go to bed and it'd be fully mm -hmm. charged in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so therefore having that conversation um, is, uh, is important. And, and thinking about, I don't want to make myself not able to attract tenants or residents because I don't have what they're looking for. So for okay. sure. Yep. All right. I think we're coming up on time here, Emily. I have one more question if I can yeah. another bit of your time. Um, on the goal setting discussion, um, I really have limited experience maybe with like balancing a bunch of different priorities within an organization. Like I have one project where there's two groups within the company and we have to set goals together, but they have different objectives. And so that's, I feel like a manageable conversation, but in larger organizations where you have like five different stakeholder groups and they all have different goals and 
um, priorities within the company, how do you approach that conversation of setting communal team goals across all of them and trying to balance their priorities? Do you have any like tips or tricks or strategies for like forcing them to prioritize between themselves? Yeah, I mean, we what we like to do is we will actually use a, a grid, uh, a, like a four square grid. And we will, I'm trying to find my slide on that. Um, we'll like figure out like what is the impact on the business on, on, on one side of it. And then across the bottom, we'll say, what are the impact on stakeholder expectations? And then we'll ask the question, your goal, where does it fall in that? Does it meet stakeholder expectations and have an impact on the business? Then it's going to be in that top right-hand corner. If it doesn't, maybe it doesn't meet the <coughs> stakeholder expectations, but it does have an impact on the business. Maybe that's kind of over on, on the left-hand top, right? So I end up with four quadrants. And really, I'm going to try to focus on that top right. So I'm going to look for things that both impact the stakeholder expectations and that really impact the business expectations as well. And then that also gets me from acting on things that are important instead of things that are just urgent, right? And are things that are, are, are not important to the organization or even, even worse yet, things that aren't important and don't impact the business. And oftentimes we spend a lot of our time down in that lower quadrant doing things that have no impact on the business and the stakeholders don't care about. And we spend so much of our time there that we're, we're kind of wasting our time. So that helps focus it out. We do that by interviews. We do it with surveys. We literally rank it and we try to figure out where does it fall. And we literally will build that quadrant and, and map it. And it, it, it's actually a good exercise. Okay, awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, finding a way to quantify it is always um challenging and like setting up a system so that there's numbers attached to it. And then you have no quantitative objective values to compare. <laughs> right. We can have a conversation about numbers. It's hard to have a conversation about opinions because everybody has one. Agreed. And nobody else's is right, but mine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or so they think. Too. <laughs> <laughs> or so they think. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chris. Um, Abigail, you wanna wrap us up? Um, sure, yeah, thanks again, Chris, for everything. Um, and uh, myself and Lisa Johnson from Edward Jones will be presenting in two weeks uh, for a conversation on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we hope you can join us as well for that coffee break. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at chapter events. So thanks again for attending today. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Chris. Thanks, Chris. Bye -bye. Thanks, Thanks for guys. your questions, everybody. Have a great weekend.